You could take attendance, great. <laughs> I still need to, yes. All right, so it is 6.30 on June 22nd, 2023. That is mine, thank you. I almost took off with, a, with my phone again. <clears throat> did I say that on mic? I guess I did. Let's try it again. June 22nd, 2023, 6.30 p.m. We'll call the regular monthly meeting of the Scarborough Sanitary District to order, and we'll do a roll call. Jason. Here. Tony. Here. Mike. Here. I'm Nick, and I'm the chairman. Next order of business, approval of the May regular monthly meeting minutes. Thank you, Jason. Second. Thank you, Tony. All in favor? None opposed. I forgot to ask. Any corrections? I hope not. We already voted them fine. Good. Four to nothing. All right. So we have the superintendent's of report, or would you like to move 7A up so that the audit can get done now? Yeah, let's do that. Why don't we offer our auditor a chance to tell us how we did last year? Please introduce yourself. Well, first, let me. Uh, oh. 2002 annual audit report. Uh, 2022. Okay. There you go. <laughs> uh, uh, Willette and Associates has completed their uh, our annual report. Uh, they will present the report to the board. We'll take any questions regarding the audit, after which I will present our annual report and uh, copies of both documents were previously provided, and I recommend approval of the annual audit. Do we need a motion from the start? Motion for okay. approval. We have a motion to approve the annual audit. Second. No, I'm asking oh, for one. Oh, I sorry, can't do I that. <laughs> no. Do we have a motion? Uh, motion to approve the Thank annual you. audit. Thank you, Joe. All right. Now our auditor can present. My apologies. Ah, oh, shoot. All set? Yes. Well, thank you again for having me come down um, to present the audit. Uh, I've put together this small PowerPoint just to kind of outline um, some of the financial data that's in the financials. So kind of how I go about my presentations is that I'm going to, you should all have received a copy of the financial um, and also the, the letter to the trustees that basically give the results of the audit. And this PowerPoint kind of follows those, those two documents through. Um, I usually do this uh, overview. If I can get this to work here. So I, I always do a general overview just for people who are not um, not really familiar with audits. Um, we're hired by the trustees to independently um, perform procedures on the financial information and the internal controls. And what that does, um, it, it definitely, we, we provide an opinion on the financial statements um, so that when these financial statements are reviewed by people outside the public, third parties that provides them an assurance um, that what they're looking at is um, accurate and, and presented fairly. Um, the other part of our audit is we look at internal controls of the district um, and looking at those internal controls and performing our procedures, we can um, definitely advise management if there are suggestions we have to improve those controls. So over financial reporting and and then the third thing is uh, the financial statements are in accordance with GAP and GASB and if there are new standards that come out um, we can advise them how to um, implement those standards and so that their financial reporting continues to be inconsistent with with those standards 
we're going to look at you know and, and also if you have questions you can certainly ask them as I'm going through um, sometimes that's easier as we're looking at that piece of information but the next the next slide talks that again next slide talks about the letter to the trustees and I've kind of summarized it here on this slide here um, so as part of part of the audit we're required to communicate directly to the trustees certain areas of results of the audit um, there are, the, the letter is structured so that they have um, bullet points and italicized areas to separate our required communications the first one is the qualitative aspects of accounting practices it should be about the middle of the first page um, it talks about new um, significant new accounting policies adopted uh, significant ex estimates and significant disclosures uh, looking at the um, letter you can see that there are no new standards that were adopted uh, during the year that means looking at your financials um, the processes of recording that information and the disclosures and the actual report hasn't changed so when you the the district's report is comparative so you can look at both um, last year's and this year's information one significant estimate that's included in in the audit is depreciation so that's a that's a standard that requires that when you purchase um, capital assets that um, you recorded over management's estimated useful life of that as of that um, asset rather than just expensing it in the year you buy it currently the the district's depreciation is about $1.6 million. And of course, you have significant structures and buildings and plant and things like that, which make up that amount. Um, we didn't have any really significant disclosures. All of the disclosures currently in the district's um, financials haven't, haven't significantly changed, and they are pretty uh, consistent with, with GAP. So we didn't have anything significant to report for a disclosure to bring to your attention going on to the the next page we have other areas such as difficulty in performing the audit um, certainly if we had difficulties with management when we we're performing our audit um, we would communicate these directly to the trustees and you can see that we've I've noted that we didn't have any difficulties bef performing the audit um, uncorrected misstatements uh, disagreements other representations or consultations that happened during the audit we didn't have any of those things um, other findings issues or other matters with internal controls um, the internal controls are certainly con consistent with prior years we have no um, recommendations to changing those just to sneak back to the uncorrected misstatements there should be a um, two two misstatements on the back of this letter um, I'm just going to grab that document so one of them has to do with Gasby statement 87 which has to do with leases and this is a new one that came out this year but the the district at this point has not adopted that um, the other is other po post employment benefits uh, you can find these disclosed in your financials on page 21 note 7 and note 8 um, just to give an update on the leases piece um, the district is a lessor not a lessee um, so you're required to basically put a liability on the books as to um, who you've given a use a right of use to your assets which would be the tower so you have certain leases with third parties on the on the district's tower to use that use that area to you know, and you you collect you know rent revenue for that um, GASB 87 touches upon that mainly on lessees not lessors 
um, and it requires you basically to put a liability and an asset on your books for those for those items. Um, currently, when we reviewed that as part of our audit, we found that activity um, not really material to your financials. It's just a small piece. So at this point, we've decided not to adopt it um, and just to continue the accounting as normal. Um, it, it, if the tower, if you have more, you know, people renting space on that going forward, we'll look at that each year to see if it becomes a significant item to your financials other than just the rent revenue. And um, at that point, we would recommend adopting that. And you'd, you'd basically, it would be something for report only. It wouldn't be something that um, management would have to change any type of accounting processes to, to put in there. The other post-employment benefits, um, again, we haven't deemed that material to the financials either, so we have that as a, as a past adjustment or an, un, an audit difference when we performed our procedures. Those numbers there basically show, um, you know, the, the, well, let me go back. The, the other post-employment benefits, that has to deal with um, main municipal trust and they, that they offer a benefit for the employees of the district to purchase insurance after they retire. Um, with that benefit, the actuaries take a look at the current employment of the district and they, they project a certain liability and um, asset for that piece of the benefit that you offer. Um, again, that, that was, that amount basically changed about $14,000 this year, um, which again is very immaterial. And this really doesn't, you, you're supposed to put a liability and an asset on the book, on the report to show the changes in, um, what's been paid in compared to the liability and Liability at this point is $162,000 is what they're projecting, but um, again, that's still not material to your financials. Um, and secondly, it really, um, in my opinion, doesn't offer a lot of value to your financials to disclose the entire amount because at the end of the day, if, if one of your employees retires, and starts paying for the benefits, it's still not coming out of the district's pockets. They have to pay for that. So it's kind of, and, and on top of that, the other piece is that um, the district is not bound to purchase this type of insurance from Maine Municipal Health. They can tomorrow go somewhere else and purchase their insurance at another location, or another vendor. And at that point, that whole disclosure would go away. So the amount of accounting that would have to go into that um, and really not having a, a true liability to the district at the end of the day when someone retires, we didn't feel that that was necessarily needed to be adopted. Any questions on that? Both of those I disclosed in the financials, um, and you can look at those on page 21 of the financials. So with that, there's, there was no other, any other questions on that letter? Okay, we'll move to the financial statements. Um, Financial statements, the structure hasn't changed. I, I put this slide in just to kind of look at the table of contents. You have comparative financials to the prior year. Um, the first, first letter is our in, independent auditor's report. Um, then comes the management's discussion and analysis. This kind of summarizes some of the financials and um, highlights uh, for a general reader, you know, all the significant changes that occurred during the year. Financial statements are the same, statements of net position, statements of revenue expenses and changes in net position, statements of cash flows, then the notes to the financials, 
following those with some schedules of operating expenses and then the superintendent's report. No significant changes to this this year. I'm going to skip over the management discussion analysis, um, but I will say that, you know, again, our opinion letter starts out the whole financial, and we, we issued an unmodified opinion on the financials. This is a clean opinion. I'm going to move over to page 12, which is a statement of financial position, and I've set up some slides to um, separate the assets up top and the uh, liabilities and net position underneath that. Looking at the assets, um, you can see comparative to 2022-2021, uh, the, the district basically increased their assets by about $1.5 million this year. Uh, and I've got a graph here that shows kind of the growth of the assets. We're looking at cash, um, the investments of the district, accounts receivable, and then inventory and other assets. Other assets haven't changed significantly. Um, that's made up of mostly your, some bond acquisition fees and prepaid expenses that are on your financial. The inventory is a small inventory. It's about 170,000. That's primarily, you know, some supplies and then materials that the district would need for emergency repairs if that would ever to occur. Accounts receivable are pretty consistent to the prior year. Uh, 1.12 million last year, 1.13 this year. Um, no real significant changes in that. Uh, cash and investments. Uh, the investments you can see has some particular growth to it. Um, and this is uh, basically the, the um, fees for connection and the capacity fees that are collected each year go into those, those funds that make up the investments. Cash you can see is um, fairly consistent with the green bars, uh, it goes up and down based on uh, accruals at the end of the year, or um, you know, if you haven't, if, you're, if your receivables go up, then your cash is going to go down because you haven't collected it, that type of thing. So you're going to have a little bit of up and down with that, but for the most part, it's still at 1.5 million and consistent with prior years. I separated out the capital assets of the district because they are uh, right now you're at 18 million. If I were to put them on the asset slide, it would skew everything down so you couldn't see it. So I've I've matched that up with the debt um, as of December 31st, 2022. Uh, the district has one more bond payment, which I believe is in October, and then you're done. So right now, all of that bond bond payable is sitting as, as a current portion to be paid this year. Other than that, you'll see a, a swing in accrued expenses. Uh, this has to do with the town of Scarborough and the 114 route that was that project that went underway this year. At the end of the year, they, they still hadn't received an invoice but had an estimate of the amount that was going to be owed to the Scar Scarborough for that project, that shared project. So that's been accrued. Um, other than that, when you look down through, you have just the normal accounts payables, uh, accrued salaries, compensated absences, which is your sick and vacation time, uh, and some accrued interest, and most of those are pretty consistent from year to year. So that's kind of what it looks like on a graph with the liabilities as I went down through those. Um, I didn't put on the... Uh, current portion of bonds payable because that was on the previous slide. But I'm, that, that one project that sometimes happens at year end where you have to accrue a certain amount of expenses that was owed in the year that, that it happened. So that's why it's off a little bit. Any questions on that?
Taking a look at the current ratio with that, with that accrual and your payables, um, certainly dropped your current ratio down to 1.4 to 1. Again, I think that's just timing. It's probably not the normal um, current ratio. And the current ratio, again, is can your current assets that you, that you have cover your current liabilities? Looking at the financial straight up, I mean, you have $2.8 million of current assets, uh, $1.9 million of um, current liabilities. So you certainly can cover it almost one and a half to one at the end of the year. But that, that 1.3 next year will definitely go, to, go away unless you have a different project. Um, and that's still a, a pretty strong um, pretty strong position for the district, even though that that one accrual is in the financials. So my, I have a question about, and I probably ask this every year, what's a good strong indicator for a district? Five to one, two to one, three to one, what do you see in the industry as a good benchmark? Well, a good benchmark I think is, is probably right around 3.5 to one which was last year's. I think that's a, that's a reasonable amount. Um, a better way to look at that would be, you know, how much, how much current assets do I have compared to, you know, what your normal expenses are. And obviously you'd like to um, keep enough to cover expenses so that if for some reason you didn't have revenue, um, you could still operate the district for a certain amount of time. The one thing that this current ratio doesn't take into consideration is your investments. So you're collecting a lot of fees out of what you bill out every month, and they go into certain funds that you know the trustees have designated for certain areas. That's that's about 9.3 million dollars right now. So um, certainly that's not in this ratio because it's not considered a current asset, but it is something to consider because. It's basically a, a designation by the trustees, which at any one point they can undesignate if there's certain so, things that happen. I'm sorry, I, I'm an engineer, I don't understand accounting. <laughs> it's money in the bank. Why wouldn't it be considered an asset? Well, it's, it's considered an asset, it's just not considered a current asset. Something you're using every day to operate the district. So you have 1.5 million in your operating checking to operate the district. You're going to get another 1.1 million coming in probably j just after December um, for those billings that happened. Um, and you know you look at the total expenses, which we'll get into um, probably on the next well one of the next slides. But the the district's budget is right at about 4.5 million. So. You know, you can look at what it costs per month to run it. Um, getting into those investments wouldn't really happen if, unless there's a significant emergency. It's money in the bank, not in your wallet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Looking at the net position, this is the equity in the district, and, and again, um, we're looking at the, at the financials, which shows uh, 17 million, 7.8, 17.8 million invested in capital assets. That's out of the total 28.5 million in equity that's in the district. That's important that um, you understand that the 17.8 is not spendable because it's basically your capital assets net of debt, sitting in the ground, sitting up in buildings, um, those things you can't spend, but you do have equity in that. The rest of it, the 10 million, 10.6 million, 10.7 million, that's all unrestricted. Um, I've classified the, the investments you have in those funds as board designated, so I carved that out of there, leaving about 1.3 million of unrestricted um, net position that that can be used. You do not have any um, outside restrictions on any of your, your assets. Sometimes when you have bonds, they restrict some assets for, for debt service. The district doesn't have any of that. Uh, 
This is just a simple slide just to show you revenue trends. Uh, the district has certainly had growth. It's up to almost 4.2 million. It grew a couple hundred thousand dollars, and we're, we're changing to page 13. Sorry about that. Um, and again, on this page 13, you have your operating revenues and your operating expenses. And then you have non-operating revenues um, and expenses, and then some capital contributions. So just looking at operations, um, you're looking at an operating loss of 268,000 compared to 282 last year. Um, you do see some growth in your revenues. They're up about a couple hundred thousand for that, while your um, expenses only you grew, grew probably about the same as your, your revenue. Um, the, the operating expenses are grouped based on cost centers. Um, and there's a schedule in the back, pages 23 and 24, your financial that breaks those out into natural categories. So you compare them year to year to see your increases and decreases. Now the operating loss, it should be, it should be known. One of the expenses in, um, one of the expenses that's spread out through these cost centers is depreciation. So it's items you've already paid cash for, but you're taking the expense this year. Again, I mentioned that was about 1.6 million. So if you, it's really a non-cash activity. So if you pull that out, um, you're going to see that you definitely had profit for your operating revenues. Um, a lot of that profit, again, was the capacity fees that were put into your investments. If that makes sense. Mike, how often or how long a period do we as a district depreciate our assets? The, the assets are based on what management estimates for them, first of all. And if, if they don't have a good estimate, we do follow on some of these assets um, PUC. Maine PUC has a, has a guide out there. So a lot of the structures in the ground, you're looking at 40 years, 50 years. Um, you know, things like uh, equipment, vehicles, computer equipment, those type of things, those are more under 10 years as a, as a rule of thumb. So say we have a pipe at the ground depreciated over 50 years. It's 60 years old. Mm -hmm. Does it no longer count as an asset? After it's fully depreciated, if it's still in use, it, it still counts as a, still it's count. an asset, but it's, it's basically net zero on your books. Because you've taken what you paid for it and you've expensed it. So now you have the same amount of accumulated depreciation as you do the asset value at a historical cost. So they've, they basically zero out. Okay. Um, but looking at the depreciation and looking at moving forward in future years, um, it kind of gives you an, an estimate of what you should be replacing year to year for your capital budget. That's how I've always looked at it. I mean, if you had $700,000 in depreciation, you should be looking at, you know, trying to replace $700,000 a year in, in what you have in the ground, whether it's a 10-year plan looking at certain areas or, um, you know, just keeping it up, updated on your equipment that you have on site. Um, unfortunately, the, the rest of the world doesn't work the way your 10-year plan may. And things like maybe the Scarborough Force Main, they, they decide to tear up the road. It's a good time to move that project up and take care of it so you don't have those additional costs to do it on your own schedule. Um, I see a lot of districts doing that. Um, Nowadays, those expenses, those, those are, it's a pretty expensive repair compared to prior years. Costs are, costs are higher. So depreciating that um, over 50 years, you know, it's going to be a lot higher depreciation that's going to come through the district. Uh, other, other times, if you have a, an emergency, a major break, and you just put something in, you have to now go back in and do it over again. 
we leave it up to management to, to determine whether that's just a repair and that you expense during the year or if it's more of a complete capital improvement because of the size of the job. Um, so in that case, if you did, did a street a few years ago and you have to go in again and do a whole new, whole new line, that prior one is usually written off and you'll see a loss in, in your financials. I think we had that a few years back when you were doing some pump stations, if you recall. Any other questions on that? So just look, just kind of finalizing this, this schedule here on, on 13. Uh, Non-operating revenues, you have, as, as with pretty much everybody I've audited in December, um, investment losses, your, your values for that has gone down. So you try, to, you try to report your investments at market on the financial. So when you have a, a market increase or a decrease, you're going to see um, that reflected as a non-operating revenue or expense. Miscellaneous non-operating revenues, I, that's where um, some of that um, lease income is included in. <clears throat> then you have your normal interest and loan fees and um, Again, some gain and loss on disposal of capital assets. Some of that loss is what, just what I talked about, was some improvements done during the year that were done before they were fully depreciated, so they were written off. After that is your capital contributions. There's a, there's a list of those that, um, the capacity upgrade fees that's in the, uh, the management discussion and analysis and also in the superintendent's report to list out those for the year. So although um, you're gonna see on the, on the next page, cash flows, you, you, you've got a change in net position or a positive change of 776,000 um, for the district, most of that is made up for the capital contributions. Um, and again, just uh, the developer contributions to the system. This is when you have a developer that puts in the sewer system and then turns it over to the district when they connect. So that's what that represents. But that 776,000, when you, when you tr look at your cash, your cash only changed by 274,000. Someone look at 776,000, they think of, you know, that should be an increase in your cash. It's not. If you look at the next page, you can see that um, the biggest, it, it, it's, this is divided, the cash flows is divided between operating activities, investing activities, and financing activities. And you see the operating activities takes out that depreciation you see it's 1.3 million. That's what you had for operating cash flow from your operating activities. What you did with that was um, you basically paid um, all of your capital assets um, and your principal payments on bonds under the financing activities to create that net change in cash, cash equivalent, just change in cash. The investing part is primarily um, moved by the capital upgrade fees that you collected. So that's all going into your investments, not your cash. So that's why there's only a small change in cash, even though you had all that come in during the year. Any questions on those? I'll just quickly go through the rest of the financial. I'm not, like I said, there's not a lot of changes. So I'll just highlight some areas and I'm gonna probably skip over a lot of pages here. Um, but it starts out with starting on page 16 of the financials. This goes through basically page um, 18 and this just outlines your significant accounting policies. 
how the district processes certain transactions. Just gives the reader an idea of how you're recording um, your information. On 18 is the um, disclosure for investments. This kind of looks at um, what you have for investments and um, what the current market values are compared to last year. Again, no significant changes there. Uh, page 19 are your capital assets. You can see your additions through the years and your retirements. Page 20 uh, is the disclosure for your bonds, pension plans, and other um, business and credit con um, concentrations. No more bond payments next year, so that's that's a that's a, always a good thing. Um, page 21. This is that note seven and note eight I talked about at the beginning of the presentation with your leases and your other post-employment benefits. You see your leases at about 72,000 is what, what's coming up for income over the next three years, um, which is kind of why we didn't adopt this um, to, to put it on your financials. It's, it's fairly immaterial to your financials. Same with the other post-employment benefits. We disclose it, we disclose the liability on there, so everybody knows what it is, but it's not recorded on your financials. Uh, question, I'm curious why the rent goes up from 23 to 24 and then takes a nosedive to... Well, I think, I think the um, leases, when we looked at this standard was, it's a five year lease and you're right in the middle of the lease, so... You only have, they, they don't necessarily have to renew. Huh. It's Verizon. They have to <laughs> renew. They're not required to. It's in the lease that they can, they can opt out if they find a better tower. So. Then there's just some minor commitments for the district on page 22. Again, disclosing to the reader what's out there for commitments. Um, Casella's on there, um, and also uh, this sustainability plan that's in there. Any other questions on the financials? Any other general questions? Well, the management discussion analysis is just a summary of all of those financials we just went over, and it's just a way for management to basically give a summary of all those financials. People in Scarborough, they're not a lot, you know, there are going to be some people that just don't understand how that works. This summarizes that information and, and just highlights what's going on in there. That's why I, I generally don't go over it. Um, you know, in a presentation because it just, it's in simplified terms, not some of the, you know, the accounting I was talking about, um, but it's just simplified. So if someone picks up one of your financials, they can just read that and they'll already have a, a reasonable understanding what happened during the year. I think the plan is when Mike is done, Dave will finish with his management discussion and analysis. No. No, he, he's gone through the details. I will follow up with the annual report. That's what it will do. That's what he'll do. Yeah, the that annual report's in the back. the MDNA. Yes. Thank you. I would just ask the question for the record. <laughs> it's a good question. It's a good question. I, I know the answer, but. Thank you. So, All right. Well, thank you very much for having me come down. Thank you. I appreciate it. If you have any other questions or if you get inquiries, you certainly can touch base with me and I can uh, explain anything further. Cool. All right. Thank you, Mike. So we have a motion on the floor. Oh. Go ahead. You go do that first. <coughs> Dave's going to give his annual report. So um, I am pleased to submit the annual report for Scarborough Sanitary District for the year of 2022. Uh, there is a the, the written report in, in the back of the audit 
that um, which is on page 25 thank you and uh, which is also uh, will be available online once it gets approved by the uh, board I will post both the audit and the annual report on our website um, in 2022 the district provided collection treatment to serve uh, treatment services to approximately 57 Hundred accounts and, and with an increase of uh, over 200 accounts um, of which uh, 5,300 were residential and the remaining were commercial uh, through these accounts we provide service to over 7,000 residential equivalent users and almost 3,000 commercial equivalent users in addition to those that are connected to the district's collection system, the district provides treatment for another 38 customers that utilize the sanitary district's treatment facility for the discharge of septic waste. In 2022, the district issued 135 sewer permits, um, which is essentially on, on in par with the last number of years. Uh, both private and public sewer extensions were approved in, in 2022, a total of, of 95 feet of 8-inch gravity sewers of private and uh, 549 feet of 8-inch gravity sewer and 650 feet of low-pressure force main and 23 manholes of public sewer were approved. As of 2022, the district owns and operates approximately uh, 4,000 feet of gravity sewer, another 130,000 feet of force mains, over 2,000 manholes, and 24 pump stations, plus the treatment facility, which is rated for 2.5 million gallons. Uh, in addition, the district owns infrastructure that, um, in, the, in addition to the district owned infrastructure, there is approximately 40,000 feet of private gravity sewers and another 40,000 feet of private force mains in 35 private pump stations that are um, owned by associations. The district employs 12 full time employees. The 12 full time employees are responsible for the collection system, treatment plan operation. Uh, responding to customers' needs, inspecting all the new sewer installation, and conduct, conducting the district's financials, financial activities. The total district budget, including capital expenses for 2022, was $5.7 million, up $190,000 from 2021 uh, budget, at an average cost of treatment of $1.1 cent per gallon. Uh, the budget includes several large capital projects, including a force main replacement, pump station upgrades, manhole frame and cover replacements, um, and I did include a more detailed uh, capital improvement list at the end of this report. The wastewater treatment facility processed on average 1.4 million gallons per day. Overall, we treated 515 million gallons of wastewater, which remo removed 96 percent and 99 percent of the uh, BOD in total suspended solids. Um, and a comparison for the last of the flow over the last number of years has is, is shown and um, there's been a nominal increase over the years. I think I've calculated out about two percent per, per year. Uh, the variation of flow sometimes is impacted by II. There are a couple of years, uh, back in 2006, there was a very high flow after which there was a relining project done, which uh, resulted in a, in a significant decrease in flow to the treatment facility. The total septage received in 2022 was about 40,000 gallons. Um, this is down from a uh, number of years. Uh, over the years, it, it, there's been a, not, uh, a fairly big decrease in the amount of flow. In uh, 2022, we uh, hauled off uh, um, about 23,000 um, uh, wet tons of sludge. Uh, uh, 2,300? Yeah, 2,300. Um, uh, Total of 76 uh, trailer dumps uh, left the facility with sludge that uh, had to go to, 
to the landfills. Last year, we budgeted 1.9 for capital expenditures, and um, again, you know, a large number of these included uh, generator replacements, some um, rolling stock, some trucks, um, the uh, um, a compressor, some some uh, testing equipment, and then the big one was the force frame replacement on Route 114. Uh, in closing, I, you know the district remains de dedicated to an efficient treatment uh, facility at Scarborough um, that protects our marshes and rivers and oceans. And I would uh, like to express my appreciation to the trustees in the sanitary district and the town manager and staff. Um, this and the citizens citizens of Scarborough for their support during 2022. And that is my annual report. Well, if you have any questions. Barring none, I think I'll take a vote. All in favor. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Enjoy the summer. Okay. Now that my mic is back on, I'll ask the superintendent not only to give to give his operations report. Okay. A uh, copy of the monthly report of operations for the month of May is included in your packet. Our average effluent flow was one point eight billion gallons per day. Our effluent quality again was well within our permitted limits. We averaged 92% BOD removal and 97% TSS removal uh, for concentrations of 17 and 6 milligrams per liter, respectively. Copy of the pump station flows for the month of May is also included in your packet. No concerns were noted. Um, pump station 2 wet well upgrade is ongoing. Shop drawings are currently being reviewed. On-site work is scheduled to begin early September. Uh, the new odor control actually has arrived at the treatment facility. Uh, we just unloaded it the other day we act and began installation of the uh, new unit. Uh, prior to it, arri it arriving, Paul, Carl, and uh, Sean, and Rudy worked within the odor control room in the demolition and preparation of uh, for the new unit. Uh, we met with Westphalia to go over the proposed design of the dewatering upgrades. Uh, Westphalia is the centrifuge, um, is a centrifuge manufacturer. In, a in our discussions, we did go over purchasing options, uh, traditional ver uh, or equal bid, pre-qualified allowances, negotiated price, or pre-purchased by the district. Um, if we pre-purchase, uh, we could potentially shave about a six months from the delivery date of this equipment. Um, supply chain issues are a continuing problem with some of the sludge of pieces of equipment. If amenable with a board, I would like to explore this option uh, and get a proposal from Wasali, including recent bids to support any proposed uh, purchase price. Uh, we have begun our insurance renewal process, reviewing our coverages and up, updating real estate and equipment values. We will continue to work with Clark Insurance as our agent and we'll, uh, who will put our coverage out to bid. Uh, actually, we'll be meeting with them next week, I believe, to go with some of those bid results. Uh, we have received our June effluent PFAS results as conducted by the state. Uh, the total PFAS measured was 58.2 nanograms per liter. And I uh, just got an email from the state saying that uh, the, these results are now available online on DEP's website and includes all of the treatment plants that are involved in this. Uh, analysis so the public can certainly have easy access to well access to the data as as need be and um, the only other thing I would like to add is um, unfortunately Phil Conley's uh, sister Phil is one of our operators at the treatment facility and has been a long time employee uh, with the district unfortunately his sister passed away um, 
last uh, Friday, I believe it was, and uh, the service and wake were yesterday, and um, I'm glad to report that the district was well represented at, at, at the services, and uh, they really appreciated the flowers that we had, had sent them. And that's all I, that I have. Any questions for the superintendent? Go ahead, Jason. I think I ask this question every month. That's <laughs> just for the record. I think I know the answer. No uh, standards set by the state on PFAS limits as of yet. There are no standards for effluent PFAS, and the results throughout the state are all over the place. I, you know, some have uh, in the teen numbers, whereas other facilities have numbers that are, you know, uh, two, three hundred uh, nanograms per liter. And it, you know, just looking at the data, there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason for the variation of the numbers. Fair enough. Thank you. FYI, Jason and the rest of the trustees, the reason that DEP is doing this it is a study to try to come up with a standard. I think that there was so much unknown, they decided to go through and select a bunch of treatment plants, test the F1, just to see what was reasonable, see where the variations are. As Dave indicated, some down in the teens, like down in Wells, uh, you have 50s, 60s here, and you know if you're more, if you're interested, the website is available. We can email a link to you. Thank you for sharing and that. The, I'm sure, our listening is the testing is the testing standard for each facility. It, the testing is actually the state has contracted with uh, Alpha Analytical. They actually come out and collect. Uh, we, we collect the samples at the facility. They came, come out and they pick up the, the samples and they run the analysis. So this is, this is really fully funded at this point from, from the mm. state except for our labor to collect the sample. Yeah, thank you. For sure. Cool. Yeah, thanks for the edification on that. I think the listening public, for those who might be listening, are interested because it's such a hot topic right now. Um, the fact that we are reporting out on it, we don't have a standard to meet. Just wanted mm. to make that clear. Thank you. Any other comments, questions for the superintendent? Um, he did ask to explore pre-purchasing the centrifuges. I don't think we need a motion for you to do that. I think that maybe just direction from the trustees um, to move forward to find out how much that would be. That'd be um, the prudent approach. I think the only time we need really need a motion is when you s present a comparison between pre-purchasing and going through the process. Okay. I was just going to comment on that. Uh, Dave, I have a question. Did they pilot the centrifuge? Yes, we did. Okay. And how many pilot tests did you have done? I know at least three that I'm aware of. We pilot tested... Um, Let's say five, not five centrifuges, but um, uh, several Street. different technologies. I, I think there was two centrifuges and three other different technologies. Okay. And yep. Is my recollection. Cool. Any more questions for the superintendent? Okay. Moving on, the correspondence, none. Old business, we have none. We took care of new business item 7A. Item 7B, lot one, mixed use development, the Downs Haggis District subdivision. So on behalf of Crossholds Holding, LLC, Goral, Goral Palmer requested approval for a proposed mixed use commercial development located along Market Street on lot one of the highest district subdivision. The applicant previously received district approval for the subdivision on May 4th in 2022. The proposed 6.1 acre site is located within the Downs development east of Higus Parkway and just north of Market Street. The proposed commercial development consists of three separate buildings on the site linked within the walkways integrated parking and shared driveways, stormwater, central courtyard and gathering places, and other common site features. The, the uh, proposed development is 
anticipated to include a 2,700 square foot bank, a 20,000 square foot office space, um, 5,000 square feet of retail space, and 3,000 square feet of a restaurant, and 4,700 square feet of, a, uh, of another restaurant. Um, at this time, building two would be constructed. Building one and three would be constructed when tenants are known. I recommend approval with the following additions. The wastewater flow allocation is for typical sanitary waste based on the following. Building one at 160 gallons per day. Building two at 3,115 gallons per day. Building three at 2,990 gallons per day. Capacity reserve fee, uh, this project is fully subject to the capacity reserve fee. The current capacity reserve fee is $19.32 per gallon. And this is adjusted monthly based on the engineering news records construction cost index. The lot has an allocation of 160 gallons per day, and that credit will be applied to the first sewer permit application. Capacity reserve fees will be paid upon application for building sewer permits. Any flows more than the approval are subject to an additional approval and capacity reserve fees. Building two's capacity reserve fee, which is the one they're proposing to build first, uh, would be at 2,950, uh, based on 2,955 gallons per day. That, you know, that's the deduction of the $160 credit. And that fee would be $48,225.60. Building one would, at 160 gallons per day would be $3,091.20. And building three at the 2,990 gallons per day would be $57,766.80. All applicable SSD standard details will be incorporated into the construction documents and sewer permits would be required for each building. Motion oh, and we, do, we do have a uh, uh, Goral Palmer here. Yes. Through, through and we'll invite Palmer. them to the podium after we have a motion. Okay. Motion to approve based Sorry. on. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Joe. And we'll invite Drew up to the mic. Please introduce yourself again. And um, can I just ask a quick question? Before yes, you we may. Start? I just I was a little confused. We've already approved this, but they're back for approval. Is we, it because we there was approved, a change? We approved the sewer extension. That's okay. it. Oh, the we didn't the ex extension the that service this lot. And gotcha. upon that approval, each of the I've, now I'm uh, forgetting the number of lots that this would, just two lots, uh, would, was given an allocation of 160 gallons per day. Uh, which, and then, uh, so that's the credit piece, so. Okay, thank okay. you. I have a question. Can you tell me why the disparity is between the gallons per day of one versus two and three? Uh, that that is um, that's because Dave deducted the 160 gallons per day already. Uh, no, no. Uh, which one are you talking about, Tony? The, the, okay. Just, just the building one, two, and three. The difference in the yeah, flows. Yeah, different flows. I was yeah. curious about what, why there was a big difference between it, one it, and two and three. Yeah. It de depends on the building use and square footage. Two are restaurants. Yeah, oh, two are restaurants. That's what it was. Yep. Okay. Okay. Now that we answered those questions, go ahead. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Drew Gagan. Drew Gagan with Goral Palmer. Uh, that that answered a lot of my question or my presentation there. But just to kind of recap real quick, um, this is where we are on the Downs property. So Highgate Parkway is just over to the left. This is the lot in the proposed bold right there. Um, as we just talked about, the Highgate District subdivision subdivision was approved last year. We wanted to get the roadway and infrastructure in at first. They wanted to clear the lots and kind of get them marketed so that we were able to um, sell off, well, we as in the development team was able to sell off one of the lots and then self-perform the one that's in front of you tonight. So this is the blown up version of it right here. Um, proposing three separate buildings and it's completely all commercial, which we're pretty excited about right off the busy Highgate Parkway. It's gonna be good, um, 
good visibility for the future tenants there. So um, it is a bit of a speculative development. So what they're proposing to do is build the middle building first, which contains 3,000 square feet of restaurant and 5,000 square feet of retail on the first floor. The two floors above that will contain office space. That's the 20,000 square feet of office. They want to construct that first with the surrounding infrastructure that includes utilities, the driveways, all the parking, and all the stormwater you see on this plan. Um, and then basically these, the, the bank over here on the left with the drive-through and the standalone restaurant, which is building three all the way to the right, are gonna be kind of pad ready and more customizable for a future tenant that comes in. So that's kind of the reasoning for the split capacity to reserve fee as well as the construction schedule. So um, pretty simple with three individual building connections to a private sewer main and we're connecting to the stub that we, uh, we left a year ago as part of the subdivision and roadway approval. Um, happy to answer any questions beyond that. Thank you. Any questions for Drew? I have one. It looks like page two, estimated flows. And it says the development was computed using Scarborough Sanitary District's design flow rules, as well as main subsurface wastewater rules. Basically, it, whichever one is more conservative. And Scarborough's tended to be more conservative with approximately 300% of average daily flow would be the max daily flow. Now, when I look at this table, I see restaurant 400, no, 4,880 gallons on page two. And then all of a sudden, it gets reduced to 2,990. How did that happen? So that was, I combined the first flows into the uses. So there's two restaurants, one's in the middle building and the other one's a standalone. So as far as the capacity reserve fee, basically only a third of the restaurant proposed on the entire site, third, third of the square footage of restaurant is proposed in that first building and it's split and moved off to this, the third building, which is the standalone restaurant. So it's just split between uses versus buildings as far as the capacity reserve fee goes. And the two restaurants are in two different this is per building. But if I had up the flow for the two restaurants, that's over that's over six thousand gallons. Am I just not looking at something right? Total flow. Yeah. Six two six. Oh, so they don't match. I guess that's where I'm having an issue. So it says restaurant four thousand eight eighty. Yet the two restaurants combined are six thousand twenty. The middle building includes also retail and office space included with that. So that's right. it's just. And, oh, all right. But they still don't match. We got 62.14 and aha. 160 versus 109. That's 109 is. is our, 160 is our minimum for a building. Thank you. It was confusing. Appreciate it. Thanks for clearing Sorry up. Sorry about that. No worries. <laughs> Now that I've gone through in the finest of details <clears throat> in the weeds, I apologize. So uh, we have a motion on the floor. Any more questions? Barring none, all in favor. Thank you, Tori. Thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, budget summary. Uh, the five-month budget summary is included in your packet. I recommend approval. Any questions for the superintendent? Barring none, all in favor? None opposed. Cool. Public comments? I don't see anyone jumping up and down to speak on behalf of the public, so trustee comments. We'll start with Tony. I thought that was a good session tonight. I thought you know, we went through a lot of it. was interesting about the, the, uh, the uh, audit. A lot of stuff there just went over my head. But it was actually a good, uh, good, good presentation. Thank Go ahead, you. Mike. Uh, another good job by the staff um, this, this month. And uh, being, what, the 22nd of June, I guess we're in a, into summer. So whoever's taking vacation or the next month, um, have a good vacation. Jason. Yeah, uh, reiterate the 
kudos to the staff, Wendy and Serena and all the others that participated in the audit. Great job once again. Thank you for all your hard work with that. I know it's a, it's a stressful time of year for you all and uh, we really appreciate all you do. Thanks to Mike and Willette Associates for the audit and the presentation tonight. Very informative and appreciated. And uh, my condolences to Phil and his family uh, for the passing of his sister. Terrible news. But uh, also want to wish everybody a safe and happy 4th of July. Thank you. Joe. I'll echo my, I'll echo my fellow trustees' comments. Um, another great uh, audit done by the staff. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Serena, uh, for all your work with that. I know it's not an easy time for you guys. And a lot of associates gave a great presentation again tonight. Um, and so my, also my condolences for Flip and uh, Sis and their family. Um, and thank you for the staff for their continued hard work. And a happy 4th of July as well. Cool. I will also echo my fellow trustee comments. Definite condolences to Phil and Sis. Um, we, we feel your loss. Uh, great job on the audit prep to Wendy and Serena. I truly appreciate all the, the hours you folks put in. Also kudos to Carl, Paul, Rudy, and Sean on the odor control project. The big piece is done and there's more to come. Good luck. <laughs> uh, have a happy and safe fourth and enjoy the rest of the summer. I'll entertain the final motion of the evening. Motion to adjourn. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Tony. All in favor? Unopposed. We're done.